All right, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to beautiful Wyandotte High School on this Saturday afternoon. All of our Bulldogs are in the house. Thank you for joining us. Um, we'll go ahead and call this meeting to order. It is Saturday, March 4th, 2023. It is officially 1.03 p.m. Sorry for being a few minutes behind, um, but we'll call this meeting to order. Again, I just uh, briefly want to give thanks to Wyandotte High School, Miss Mary Stewart, and your staff for opening your doors to allow us to be here this afternoon, um, to my board colleagues, um, and to all of our staff for being here on a Saturday afternoon. And a special thank you and welcome to all of our guests, our community members, our families who are here to give your input and thoughts. We're really grateful for all of you to spend part of your Saturday, beautiful Saturday afternoon with us here at Wyandotte. So um, with that, I will read our board norms and protocols. So this is an official special meeting of the board. So we do um, have to run through and actually open the meeting and do a roll call. So I'll read our board norms and protocols as we do at every board meeting. We agree to respect differences of opinions in making decisions for the district to follow best practices in managing the superintendent and the management of the board itself, to stay on task when conducting business for the district, including while at board meetings, to never surprise the superintendent or each other when conducting official business of the district, to read these norms at the beginning of each board meeting and at board workshops as a reminder of how to conduct our meetings, and to continually self-check to determine if we're following our norms when conducting district business. Um, again, good afternoon and welcome to everybody. Just a reminder, there are some snacks, water, tea in the back table. Please help yourself as you need. Um, and then the men's room is to the right, to my right, as you exit the door in the hallway. Um, and the ladies room is to my left um, before you hit the next cafeteria, it's in the hallway there. So men's restroom to my right, women's restroom to my left. All right, Ms. Smith, would you please do a roll call? Randy Lopez present. Thank you. Can I get a motion to approve today's special agenda? Second. Moved and seconded. Any questions? Seeing none, Ms. Smith, roll call. Maxine Drew, yes. Randy Lopez, yes. Motion carries, agenda is approved. Okay, we're gonna run in right into our agenda, um, our one agenda item. Um, and before I pass it on to Dr. Stubblefield, we do have some information that we're going to share um, before we break out into groups. Um, but again, on behalf of the Board of Education, I do just wanna say to all of our guests that are with us, um, thank you. Thank you for giving of your time. This is really important for us so that we can hear from you um, what's important to you um, what questions you might have of us uh, uh, and the district as, as a board and as a district. Um, and we want to, to, to hear and to listen about what's important so that when we make decisions, we, can, we know that we're hearing from you. We get a chance to hear from you individually, but this is an opportunity, one opportunity for us to hear collectively from you. So we're thankful for you giving of your time. Um, and we're excited to hear from you. So, um, and board, um, I'd, I'd say if there's anything anyone wants to add um, from the board's perspective. If not, I will hand it off to Dr. Stubblefield and thank our superintendent of schools, Dr. Anna Stubblefield. Uh, we don't have to have that. Good afternoon. Thank you all for being here. Um, we know that we may have some people join us, but we're going to um, start. I'm going to start by allowing our facilitators to introduce themselves and talk about what the meeting would look like. And then I'll come back and run through some slides very quickly. So we just all have the same information when we're starting a conversation. So I'm going to turn it over to our facilitators. Actually, I'm going to take this. They don't have to necessarily stand there. Thank you, Dr. Stubblefield. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for taking your Saturday. Um, what did you say I was supposed to do? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm being silly, I'm sorry. So, um, my name's Gordon Criswell, and I will be one of your facilitators. Um, the purpose of this meeting is to hear from you all 
about some questions that we want to pose, and we'll get to those later. Uh, but first, I want to just uh, kind of lay out some ground rules. Every group uh, has a set of norms, if you will, about how we behave. And um, normally, I would have these up on a flip chart somewhere, but I did not do that today. So just think about rules of groups. What would you think would be appropriate rules for our group today? Let me give you an example. Um, listen. Everyone gets floor time. Um, be respectful of other people's opinion, right? Um, share your thoughts and uh, uh, participate if you voluntarily wish to do so. Vol uh, group is always voluntary. You participate as a group, volunteer, vol you volunteer. And uh, so those are sort of the basic norms for group behavior. Now, are there other kinds of group norms that you all think we should add to that list. So here's where you get to say, Gordon, I think we should add X. Does anybody have any other norms, any other group? Yes, ma'am. Listen, listen to understand. Perfect. Anybody else? Listen to understand. That is probably one of the biggest group norms that we can uh, think of because everybody's opinion is important, and if you're talking over someone, you're not listening. So listen for understanding. Miss anything? Okay, Erica. Hola, buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Erika Andrade y estoy aquí para proveer servicios de interpretación para personas que necesitan español. Uh, solo para verificar que mi servicio es necesario. ¿Hay personas en la audiencia que necesitan interpretación en español? Perfecto. Muchas gracias. We're all, good. We're all good. Thank you. All right. Dr. Stubblefield has some slides she wants to run through, and then we will really get to work. One of the things, as we um, heard from um, community members and staff um, around um, some of the things that were coming up that are um, important topics, uh, today we're focusing primarily on academics and um, safety. And I'm just going to give some data around where we are um, academically, as also some data around um, what's happening within our schools safety-wise. A couple of staff members are passing out handouts. A lot of the things that you have in your hand, I'll go over here. Um, but then that'll help us when we're engaging in the conversation around these two important topics. So the first slide, we just always want to remind everyone what our North Star is for the district. And our um, goal is for by 2031, 100% of our students will graduate with the Diploma Plus credential with no disparities in race or gender subgroups. And this is hugely important to us because if our students are engaged academically, it'll, uh, we know that they will be um, very good community members for us. Um, just to remind everyone of what, how we receive our accreditation, we receive that through the KISA accreditation process. We will um, actually um, get our determination for accreditation this year. This is our year to be evaluated. But these, uh, this information, and I'm sorry that the slide is not there, but this allows you to see all of the things that um, drives what we do um, and what our board um, what we connect, what we're doing to. So it's our KISA, it's our district strategic plan, our MTSS and our school improvement plans. And you see on there, there are things around um, SEL, um, academics, engaging students in all um, areas. One of the things I also wanted to share with you, because actually I don't know if we had done this publicly yet, but this fall our board spent several hours working together to come up with three goals to simplify that last slide that you all looked at. And their goals were, the first goal is around problem solving and critical thinking and self-reflection skills. I'm not going to read that. Um, what it says under there. You can read it for yourself. And the second goal was around physical and mental health supports. And the third, third one was around fiscal and facility management. Um, so I just, as we present information to our board and as we look at things, these are the three things that we uh, make sure that we're connecting it to. And we um, 
make sure that we have data and we're doing a better job and we'll make sure that we continue to be as transparent as possible around the data, around the programs, and we're evaluating all those things. But our board did spend a lot of time on these goals and this is what we'll use to drive our decision making um, as we move throughout um, this year. I, when I talked about we want 100% of our students to graduate with a Diploma Plus, we thought it was important for you to know where we are currently. Last year, we had 49% of our students who graduated, they had a Diploma Plus credential. For this um, school year, our target in order for us to be um, um, on time with 100% in 2031, we need to reach 55%. And the class that will be that first class to be the 100% class are our current fourth graders. So um, when we look at the trajectory is absolutely attainable and we will continue to add more pathways and opportunities for our students to ensure that. We also, felt it was important and our um, curriculum instruction team and our Diploma Plus team have worked with all of the feeder systems to so that they can see exactly where they need to be this school year in order for us to get to 55%. So it shows you the number of students that each high school will have to have to graduate this year um, to get to that. And we are on target to meet that goal and possibly exceed it um, with the things that we've worked with, with our high school principals and also our elementary so that as they get to the high school and get on the path for graduation, that we can ensure that. So they know the raw number of students this year and they know exactly who already has it who's closed or what we need to do to make it happen. And so we have the trajectory for the next um, nine years. Um, you can't see this, but you have this handout in your folder. It is our accountability report. And what that show, annually, we have to post this on our website. It is a posted on our website. We have a, tab, it's in multiple places, but we have a tab connected, um, it says Board of Education. And on that tab on our website, you will always find our um, academic accountability report, also our financial accountability report, and any required documents that are required by the state that we publish. We have to publish, you'll find all that information. And so I just wanted to put that in front of you. And this for us is our reality and where we're starting from and how we started to build off um, focusing on making sure that 100% of our students graduate with a Diploma Plus because we know it will improve their um, academic outcomes, how they perform on the state assessments, as well as improving our graduation rate. I will say on this report this year, we did receive recognition this year from the state for um, what we do around social emotional learning. We received a copper star, um, but our goal is to receive recognition in all of the areas um, that we are evaluated in. Um, the, I'm transitioning a little bit um, into our student support and SEL. SEL is our social emotional learning and mental health programs that we have in the district because as we think about safety and academics of our students, we have to think about their social emotional learning as well as their mental health. So um, this is just letting you know some of the programs that we have in place. Um, a couple of them, if you were uh, enough as enough, you heard a lot about the behavior health and first call. And um, first call is the um, organization that we uh, partner with. And it, it's some information on that on one of the high, um, handouts that we partner with to do a lot of our preventive education around drugs and alcohol and um, those sorts of things. During COVID, it did get paused for a while, but we definitely made sure this spring that we ramped it up. We have a plan for all of our elementary schools that is happening right now and it will continue through the end of the year. And we also have some education happening in our middle and high schools, but we do start as early as elementary. It was paused for a couple of years. We have reintroduced re that. Our social emotional learning components around trauma sensitive and those kind of things is really um, us focusing on trying to teach our students about um, decision making and responding differently when adversity 
and or difficult situations come up. So um, these are a couple of things. It also shows you the number of support staff in these areas. So we have 67 counselors, 61 social workers, 25 school psychologists. Some of them are in person, some of them are virtual. Um, we have seven behavior um, analysts, um, seven registered behavior technicians, and 11 restorative justice facilitators. I didn't talk uh, about on there, You'll on your handout, you'll see that we've, all of our high schools have been through tier one training for restorative justice, and we'll continue to build that out at all of the levels and continue to provide the um, professional development around that. Sometimes people conflate restorative justice with not holding students accountable or saying students can't be suspended. Restorative justice is really about helping students know and understand um, how do you, if you do something, make a situation right? How do you preventively engage in a conversation so that it doesn't lead to poor decision making? And um, how do you go and hold yourself accountable and move forward with those that you have to engage with? It is not something that, that when you're talking about changing a mindset, it takes a while, you know, for it to work and move forward. So we'll continue to incorporate that and make sure that we have the protocols in place to keep our students safe while also holding um, individuals accountable for things that come up. I did want to share this with you so that you will just know around discipline and safety. Um, so in the first slide, it shows the number of suspensions we had at every level um, for fighting last year and where we are comparatively this year. Um, uh, once a quarter, our, we give an update to our board around the academic and discipline data, data but I because we're engaging in conversations about academics and safety, I just wanted everybody to have that general information. So if you look through each slide, it gives you the total number of each le a level for fighting, weapons, drugs, um, and then guns, um, it's not on a chart, but it is the, at the bottom. Last year, we had one gun, like actually in our schools um, or on our campuses. And th so far this year, we've had three. Um, now, that doesn't account for what happens outside of the school campuses or in the school communities that may bleed over into our schools, but these are actual guns that were in uh, in our um buildings. And then it also shows you over there the total number of suspensions um, that we've had um, so far this year and the number of expulsions. And when a student is expelled, they are suspended for 186 days. I'm looking at Mr. Collins. Is that correct? So we currently have seven students who have been expelled. When that occurs, we um, work with the student and the family to make sure that they are connected so that they can continue their academic pro um, progress. And there are a couple of partnerships that we have to ensure that that happens. Yes. So, okay, so weapons are defined by, um, there are some statue around it. So it could be a knife, um, it could be a bat or anything that is pepper spray, anything that can be used to bring harm for towards someone else. So that's what a weapon, and those weapon numbers do not include the gun numbers or do they? I'm looking at. Yeah, so we separated it out. So it could be any sort of thing that is not a gun that was intended. Yeah. And then um, we also wanted to let you know, like, what are our top 10 disciplinary infractions? Um, and I would say most of these, not m at least the Several of these lead to suspension automatically. I don't want to generalize, but those are the top 10 disciplinary infractions within our school system. Um, and you, we look at the data from multiple lenses around um, race, gender, ethnicity, all of those things as we are working um, with um, our team and our families to try to um, um, help students make different decisions. So that is my last slide. Um, if it's helpful for to you and your conversation, I can leave whatever slide up there or go back to a slide. But 
now what we would like um, all of you to do is to really engage in conversations. We do have some guiding questions and we have staff members that will be able to gather the um, information and put it in a, a Google Doc so that we can go back and look at it. And then we'll have an opportunity to share out from the groups. I um, am looking around. I see a lot of staff members, and um, I, I know some staff members are also community members. So we can do this one or two ways. At the tables that you're at, we can say that's a group. If you're like just two of you are at a table, you can join a table. Or we can do two large groups. We can like just divide a room in half and have a larger conversation. But we do want to make sure that we have equity and voice and that everyone's um, voice is heard. I will say we at the very end, we will put a thought exchange up and we'll also share that thought exchange out um, to our general community so that anybody who could not be here will still have an opportunity to provide input as well. And so we'll put it out and we'll leave it open for two weeks. We'll gather all of that da data and then make sure that we share it publicly with our board and to say what our next steps are and make sure that we hear from our board around what they would like for us to do. So I said a lot. Do you all wanna just do tables or Two big groups. I see one, two big group. Okay, so we're gonna divide the room. So either you can go to this side or that side and you can, if you're in a chair and you're more comfortable in a chair, you can just turn your chair to face that group. Um, we will have one of the staff members in each group to kind of facilitate it. Um, our facilitators will keep us mindful of time. I think we have five questions. It's 1.30. We do wanna allow ample time to have discussion. So we'll target about 35 minutes to go through the questions. If we need more time, we'll add more time. So thank you. Board members, they're asking you like if you can join at a table. Um, that that way they'll have a board member at each table as well. Okay. I think they're like in three. It looked like they're one, two, three. But you can join in. Like this one is just a few people. So you can join any of these. Yes. That makes sense. Yeah. You can either join this one, this one, or this one. I think it naturally turned to three. And then board members, we're asking you to just pick a table. You can listen in um, to hear what they're saying, and then we'll share out. So you, you are one of the facilitators? Yes. Okay, great. And where's the other facilitator? Okay, just want to – and one at – okay. Okay. They need one more person at this far table to my right. So while you guys are, are moving and, and getting set up, let me just uh, share with you all uh, this book that I just got hot off the press. It's entitled, When Everyone Leads, The Toughest Challenges Get Seen and Solved. And I think uh, this is a primer on leadership. And if you can think about how do you solve the really tough challenges of the district, it requires a level of leadership and a level of thoughtfulness. So just something to, to keep in mind as you work your way through these uh, five questions. And uh, I will try and keep you guys on task. All right, carry on. See you in 35 minutes. All right, ladies and gentlemen, if I can have your attention up here, please. Um, <clears throat> let's reconvene so we can hear uh, some of the reporting out uh, from the other groups. 
Let's reconvene as a big group so we can hear some of the reporting out from the groups uh, about the questions. Uh, one thing, if you hear someone report out something that is similar to what your group has reported, don't repeat that for the interest of time. Let's try to capture as much new information as we can. I heard some really great discussion, and I'd like to be able to uh, uh, make sure everyone uh, has a chance to share what you've been talking about. So uh, I know we had one two, three, four groups. So let's start with question number one. And whoever wants to volunteer first, uh, if otherwise I'll call on you. So the first question was, what do you believe are the strengths of the academic programs in Kansas City, Kansas public schools? Which group wants to report first? Hello, hello. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, one of our strengths is that, uh, that our schools offer AP courses, IB courses, and college level courses. I'm going to stop there because we have another, we have a caveat to that um, and a question to that. So we provide our students higher level courses. That's a great Thing. Okay. Now, did any other groups come up with something similar to what she just said? That our school system offers high-level courses, AP, IB, and college-level and college-level courses. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Stofield. Something similar was stated, but it was um, the whole Diploma Plus concept was brought in, and one of our team members spoke towards their nieces and nephews having been able to graduate with, was it associate's degree? Yes. Associate's degrees um, because of that programming with dual and concurrent credits, which is that what um, Ms. Selena spoke to. Thank you. Now, do you want to get to your question now? Yes. Since we're... So because topic? we have such great programs in our district, the confusion sometimes is around what is AP, what is IB, what are the college courses, and what colleges take what? Because the discussion was around their child had taken some IB courses, and um, but then when it's time to go to college, the college may or may not accept certain courses unless you you know, pass mm -hmm. a test. And so the parents want to know just a little bit more information from us in regards to International Baccalaureate, AP, and all the comparisons and an understanding around credits and testing and things of that nature. Great. Okay. Another group? Over here. Um, we had a discussion on the opposite end that the district does a really good job with offering um, extra classes, tutoring, summer school support, especially the transitions for summer school to be more engaging and inclusive, not just to credit recovery, but other opportunities. So if students are falling behind, there's plenty of opportunities for the district to come in and support with that growth and catch up. Anybody else? Because what I heard was a couple of things. And our group discussed somewhat similar, but the big focus as it related to academics was bringing in additional programs that have voice, a student voice that is student led um, and that is student supported, which was one of the questions for today, where are our students um, today? We are here having a, having a conversation, dialogue about our students, but the question is where are our students today? And so providing a platform and a forum for them to have the opportunity for us to listen to their voice. Thank you. One of the things I heard as I was walking around was this notion of um, youth ambassadors and adv advisors in every building to, to make sure we capture those young people's 
opinions and voices and thoughts about their academic uh, education. Um, those seem like doable things. I mean, I know uh, in the course of a school day, you cram a whole lot of things into six or seven hours a day. And so it, it really requires some creative thinking, I think, to be able to offer some of these extra things that the students uh, would benefit from. So, and, and I do want to say I do appreciate centering it around student voice. I do have a superintendent student advisory. We are going to every high school and we're collecting data that we'll share with the board about their experiences in school and we'll make that public. And we've, I've been to three of them and I have Slagle on Thursday. So we, and we open that up to all students while I do um, speak to a smaller group when I go to the high schools and anywhere between 25 to 30 students who actually come and we walk through it. So we can definitely build and grow off of that. Um, several of the schools do have student councils as well, but we can make sure that it's um, in all of our schools as well. Great. So one of the things I heard about this question was kind of like on two different ends of the spectrum. On this end of the spectrum, you, you, you talked about the kinds of programs uh, in the summer that you saw as strengths to help students catch up, um, uh, have that extra learning opportunity. And on the other end of the spectrum, you mentioned these programs that we have for students who are uh, really much smarter than me, really high achievers, you know, so I need to be over here. Okay, anybody else on question one before we move to question two? Yes. That we focus too much on the recovery that it does not we lose the engagement for those who are not that's not what I saw for it. No, um, at my table they were talking about the transition that we've had over summer school that like sometimes parents understand middle school and high school to be for like catch up, but there have been more focus on inviting all students for engaging opportunities. And then I'll just add one more because I heard it at two tables, which was a highlight on my department with our English language services and that the district is really focusing on multiple languages and access to our students, so. And so, okay. and I just, so I can put it out there. Yep. Um, so um, Ms. Russell, one of the things when we look at the ESSER funds and what we're allocate, allocating or what we're trying to sustain, what we've been able to do is expand summer school to do the enrichment. And that wasn't the case before we had the ESSER dollars, but that may be a decision that the board will have to make around sustaining that if that is a financial possibility when we talk about where the money is going. Yep. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so IB is International Baccalaureate, and the only place that that is offered is Sumner Academy. If you go to Sumner Academy, you are committing to be a part of the IB program. AP is um, Advanced Placement. That is offered at all of our um, high schools and AP courses. Um, if you pass the exam at the end, you get a college credit. IB, you can get a uh interbaccalaureate diploma at the end or those kind of things but it is um, nuanced on every college doesn't recognize it and those kind of things so that is something that has come up you know in different conversations about it's great to have an IB program that's why um, Sumner is ranked number one in the state of Kansas and then in the top 10 because every student has access and takes at least one IB course. Um, when they do those rankings, the rankings is based off of exposure and access and those who actually enroll in it. And since a almost 100% of Sumner students does that, that's um, unique in a high school situation. Does that answer your question? Yep. Okay. The table, yeah. Yeah. District. Yeah. Okay, let's move to question two. What are the program areas that you would like to see uh, improvements be made in or newly created uh, in our academic program? So let's start over here. What programs? Um, we spent some time talking about like uh, more life skill or um, 
um, things such as like mechanics, cooking, sewing opportunities, that those are things that are starting to phase out um, in schools and giving kids more opportunities to focus in on those things that um, will kind of service them, like how to change a tire, finance type of pieces, and uh, embedding that within some of the structures that we have. Um, I think that was the only academic, yeah. Okay, and this is similar to something that I heard over at this tape right here about having basic, under, basic education. And if we had more time, I'd give you a real life example, but we're out of time. Go ahead, ma'am. We were uh, had a lot of diverse ideas in, in this area, and ones that I would like to highlight is replicating models that we know are working. So one of our team members spoke to the academies at Wyandotte and was wondering if we had that same system at other schools. And then another team member brought up a pilot on uh, standards-based grading. And, um, and it was discussed that it was a good program, that it promotes learning and student engagement. And so the concept of you know, replicating also comes out when, when we think of something like that. Another uh, strong point that was made was around marketing our programs better and then assisting our families and incoming freshmen to understand um, how to get to graduation, clarifying expectations and what it need, uh, what needs to happen and preparing our students to be able to enter the high school space and be able to achieve highly um, in academic areas to get to that Diploma Plus concept. Okay. Um, we absolutely agree with all the trade school um, and all the trade conversations. Um, and so, yes, we agree. But we also talked about music and arts. Uh, we want to have um, more programs, larger programs, but we also need program awareness in the elementary, middle, and high. Um, we talked about increased advance in investment in our band program and that the kids need to see other kids doing these things so they know what to aspire to when they get to middle and high school. Okay, this group. I'll summarize pretty quickly. We talked about programs already um, when I came up earlier, but what I will state is as we're looking at not only our programs, but our current curriculum that we have for our students, making sure that it is, is consistent amongst all of, around all of our schools. So when our students as a transient population may arrive at one school and transition to another, that they have the same opportunity with the research-based curriculum that has been adopted as their previous location that they were in. The other program that was highlighted was boxing clubs. Um, I know that's not necessarily around the academic, but it, it does connect um, of offering boxing clubs for our students. And that was a discussion that I heard in one of the other groups about reviving some of our clubs. Uh, boxing was, an, was not an example, but it, it is a good example of the kinds of things that young people may be interested in that we could figure out how do we squeeze that into our academic day too. Hang on. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Quickly. Just, okay, quickly. Just as a business owner, where I will challenge Dr. Stubberfield and this young lady, when you're talking about programming, I challenge the quality of the programming, okay? Because it has to be culturally competent and necessary that meets Diploma Plus. Diploma Plus is a wide range. Dr. Clemens and I programs around entrepreneurship and behavior management, not a plug, but just to tell you, the teacher wants us to be partners. They don't want to own our programs. We need to own our programs, but they need to be quality programs aligned with Dr. Stubblefield and the board. And I also would say bring business, local businesses into those programs as well. Okay. All right. This probably is a good place to mention something else I heard in the group about if you have outside folk coming in, make sure that they do what they say they're going to do because once you disappoint a young person, you've lost their interest. I heard that in a number of, of tables. Uh, make sure that the quality of the program is great, but make sure the people doing the programming show up when they say they're going to show up because that will have a serious detrimental effect on students, okay? I think that was that gentleman back there. All right, question number three. What do you all believe are the strengths of safety and SEL, which is um, 
social emotional learning supports for our students. What are the strengths of those two? Let's start with this table right here in the middle and then I'll work my way out. Try to make sure I get a hold of everybody to get a chance to All right. Talk. Strengths that were noted, having counselors and social workers in all of our school locations, um, at minimum one of each. Mm. Additionally, having our PAC program where students and families um, have the opportunity when there might be um, a issue with drugs or violence that they have programs that are offered to them outside. Um, additionally, FA teachers working with our students. Our restorative justice training that is taking place. Um, all of our high schools have gone through that process as we transition to our middle and filter it down to our elementary school sites. Um, I'm looking. And that that summarizes it pretty well for our group. Okay. This table said they don't have any. Okay. What about over here? Okay. Now, let, let me share with this table, and then I'll share with you something that I heard that I thought was extremely profound. Go ahead. Um, the officers were highlighted that they do the best that they can. They have a good rapport with our students, and our students respect them. So that's uh, so let me share with this group something that I heard, not being an educator and not having uh, children in the district because my kids gone and graduated. But this gentleman here, who I think I heard you are a principal, was a principal. What he said was very profound for me, and I wrote it down. He said, young people come to school to fight because it's safe. Some young people come to school to fight because it's safe. That kind of just blew me away. And I think you said that because those students who were fighting knew that someone was going to intervene. To me, that was very profound. Thank you. Any other, any other thoughts on question number uh, three? We're making good time, good feedback. Thank you. Question four, what are the areas you believe need improvement regarding safety and SEL supports for our students? Sort of similar to question three. All right, this table. Several of the items um, shared the same concept, which was the student voice is missing. We need to get students involved. They can be part of the solution. Um, and we were challenged to find the strengths in this area. Um, there's not enough staff uh, to support the goals for SEL, safety, and mental health. Okay. Go ahead. I'm going to have a parent come up. Um, Great. We had a challenge, too. Uh, we talked a lot about um, our athletic programs, our sports and activities needed improvement. Um, we have great fields in the area, but they're not maintained. Um, staffing, um, lots of things that we are concerned about in this area that could improve. But Seth. Hello. Uh, Seth Estes, parent of plenty of kids in the high school graduated Wyandotte 95, also a baseball coach of about 14 years now. Uh, safety and a mental and emotional, uh, sports brings that to all kids. You know, uh, it works, safety in, in your teamwork, uh, emotional support, learning from your teammates, your coaches, uh, also safety. If your children are involved with sports, what are they not doing? They're not out there on the streets getting into trouble, getting into, you know, doing drugs, getting involved with gangs. Sports is a big positive, and we definitely need more of that in the athletic community or in Wyandotte County. Uh, as far as coaching is involved, I believe we definitely need more coaches. Now, whether it be funded coaches or voluntary coaches, it works both ways. I personally volunteered to be a coach at Washington High School, filled the application out over two weeks ago. Background check has come in. I've yet to hear from anybody from the school board. You know, I see a coach out there, one coach, trying to coach 30 to 40 children at one time. That's not safe. It's not emotionally supportive. You know, sports will definitely help the community. 
We definitely need enough coaches per kids, whether it be voluntary or paid. But I, and and baseball fields. I, I see we have a beautiful football field out here. We got a beautiful football field at Washington. I believe a beautiful football field at, at Harmon. What about our baseball fields here in our communities? You know, they say that we're going to play Washington versus Wyandotte at Wyandotte, but we have to go somewhere else to play that. I believe it's Barton Ross Complex. You know, why can't we play our baseball games at our school's baseball field, which brings in more school pride, community pride. I, I think that would be a great investment for the community. Thank you. One more. Thank you, Seth. And then one one other thing is the build up to the activities. So we talked a lot about facilities and equipment, making sure that is up to par and that kids don't have to look elsewhere um, for those state of the art um, facilities. We have them here. Um, they talked about pep assembly, spirit days um, from elementary, middle and high. So to get the elementary kids excited about the high school games and then with all of this and then tying it back around to mental health and SEL, it brings friendships, relationships, pride, and that's hopefully will br bring all of the other things down. Okay. One large takeaway from our group was getting parents involved in the lives of our students. Um, the schools are uh, doing a great deal. Schools are responsible for almost every um, component of students and whether it's positive or negative, the school is doing quite a bit. So one of the areas of improvement is getting our, our parents involved and talking to students about the purpose of school so that they can look past just the day in front of them. Great point. How about over here? Um, we spent a lot of time talking about like campaigning, um, building coalitions, so thinking about inclusivity campaigns and then not just putting together things which very much sounded similar to enough is enough where the ideas were coming in, but increasing the amount of publicity that comes out about it. If rallying around that, using outlets such as the radio, flyers, social media, and blasting it out everywhere because there's a, a lack of transfer from some of the great things that we have happening in the district, going out to the parent level and to the community level. And then the other piece was also increasing access to students. While we may have a bullying hotline, how can we utilize the TVs, um, uh, bulletin boards, teachers' classrooms to provide those phone numbers to students or how do they can access it so they have that um, opportunity to report things anonymously and not just focus on students, but also the adults, right? Um, so the teachers, the, the staff members, so that people aren't um, worried about retaliation or that they can ensure that their privacy is kept. They, they really highlighted the social workers and school psychs, but how could we increase that to be not... Um, trauma responsive, but everybody receives some sort of access point to a counselor, a social worker during passing period or other opportunities. So really just increasing the way that we um, share out information on, on all um, platforms and ensuring that it's trickling down to the parent and community level and that students and families are, are engaged. Thank you. And, and Erica, I'm going to put you on the spot now, so come on up here with your great idea. Before we got started, my, my co-facilitator and I were talking, and she had this phenomenal idea. And so, not to embarrass you, but I want you to share it with the group, because to me that's a doable thing, and it makes a lot of sense. Well, just hearing a lot of the conversation, uh, I was brought in specifically to make sure that if we had any Spanish-speaking community that they would be able to uh, involve themselves and share kind of comments back. But then I started really thinking, because I keep hearing the comment of um, there's great resources, but not everybody knows. It's not somehow it's not trickling down to communities and then communities where you incorporate other barriers like language and culture, obviously that becomes even another barrier to get these resources down to this. And so I had talked to Gordon and Randy, so I'm gonna call him out too, about we need to do like a series of videos in, I said Spanish, but really we could do it in multiple languages and really getting out, out there in different platforms. It's great to put them in the school district uh, media sites, but that's not enough. We need to work with partners, both in the media community, business community was a great idea, somebody said businesses, and others to really make sure that all of the communities understanding all of these resources, A, the ones that already exist, they can provide feedback back when these kind of conversations happen if they're not getting the information for whatever reason that might be, um, but giving them 
somebody also mentioned that it has to be culturally appropriate. Those safe spaces, those culturally appropriate places where they feel they can go and say their comments and have somebody that's going to be listening to them and responding back. I think it's, it could be an opportunity to reach out to a lot of parents that maybe are not feeling as included for whatever reason that might be. So a fancy high-level video is what she's talking about. Fancy, culturally appropriate video that would talk about what we've been talking about today. You had a comment before we get to question five. Yes, ma'am. On your handout. It depends on the level in the school. Yeah. Um, so at our high schools, how many do you have? We have five here at Wyandotte. Um, then if you go down to our, and then we have three social workers. And um, if you go to the middle school, we have two counselors. And then elementary is a minimum of one. So it just depends on the level. Um, I will say that the board did commit additional dollars to make sure that we had counselors, social workers, college. And that's not counting like our college and career counselors. Like, so just counselors, we have five. Yeah. Yeah, they. I mean, we probably have more resources now. It. I think that there may be a gap that is showing around kids knowing how to access those resources. All right. Any other comments around question four before we get to our closing comments with any additional comments? Anybody got anything else they want to chime in on that you think is very, very important? Yes, ma'am. I am. I'm ready for question five. That is question. That five. is question five. So, any table have any? Yeah, I've been chomping on this one. So, as we uh, talk about um, remaining questions, it really doesn't um, give it justice to think of it as a remaining question because our partnerships with community partners and the businesses that want to help partner with us um, is really important. Um, we have partners that are committed and are trying to function and serve our schools where we might not be able to serve. We've got community members that bring from food items to teaching entrepreneurial skills in our classrooms to taking our kids in field trips, exposing them through those experiences to several cultural competencies, as well as technology that may not be available to them in their classrooms. And, and I'm looking at Flan right here with the VR equipment that they bring into our classroom. So our partners strengthen our academics. They also strengthen our community and build social capital within our community for our kiddos. Other tables, Other? okay. Sorry. All right. We. Ditto. Um, we really talked about partnerships between parents, teachers, students, businesses. Um, we talked a lot about getting our information out to barber shops and communities. And so that awareness piece was a really big deal. Um, athletic calendar, maybe our website being a little bit more user friendly um, and things of that nature. We lastly talked about our kids and giving our kids the freedom to speak their truth, ask them the questions, poll our kids all the way down to sixth grade and ask them what interests them. So by the time they get to high school, we can have um, classes and programs that meet their needs. And so the last thing, our, we had a great table, and the last thing we really focused on is back at the kids. Okay. Um, we we did spend a lot of time talking about the the access of information and I, I there was the the ideas that have been posed um, the other piece was just remembering the language barriers and increasing those supports and thinking about families um, need for support with email and technology things like that but also one one thing that was a highlight was to do more celebrations of our children and their accomplishments, support parents on how they can celebrate their own kids, um, giving them those tools of what are the things they should be celebrating, whether it's academic 
or non-academic because sometimes parents just aren't aware. Um, and then also increasing and bringing back more cultural events, highlighting multiple cultures in a district that has over 70 languages represented and making sure that we really honor that, that board commitment to um, celebrating our diversity and inclusivity and, and putting a lot of attention and um, access to those opportunities throughout the community. Thank you. Yes. In closing, um, we spent a great deal of time around student voice, um, in addition to not only student voice, parent involvement, and also our community. So helping our community to change the way we are thinking about educating our students, um, eliminate that passive um, aggressiveness and hold ourselves accountable to what um, is taking place in our schools, continuing to offer that conflict resolution, not only for our students, but also for our families, um, looking at holding forms in which our students' voices um, are heard, um, conducting an interest fair. Um, again, a, a strong focus on our students by, what, by also helping our families realize that when our students, when our schools are not in good condition, it re has a reflection on how our communities are displayed. Providing an oasis of learning and education. And here are some final questions relating to that. How do we get parents involved in making a catastrophic change that needs to take place with our students? How do we incentivize our students to keep them encouraged? And then as we focused on incentivizing our students, one recommendation was as our seniors graduate, why can they not walk out with the laptops that they've been provided during their educational journey? Interesting. So one of the things that I, I, I do, I'll get right to you, I'm gonna tell this quick story. So I, I wear these sweatshirts because I want a young person to ask me, well, did you go to Meharry Medical College? And I'm going to say, no, but you can take out your Google machine and you can learn about Meharry Medical College. So you, we have this technology now that is instantaneous, and our young people uh, just need to be prodded a little bit to figure out if they're interested in something. And so this notion of interest fairs is what, piqued my interest. Yes, ma'am. We also talked about how we grade, and we were provided some information about mastery grading. It's a new concept. It's been around for about five, seven years. You guys can correct me if I'm wrong. And maybe the way we're currently grading, how that's affecting some of our young people, because if they don't master what they need to have at the elementary level, then they just continually struggle from middle school on up. And we sort of create this environment that we need to reconsider how we grade so that we can help our students be successful. And it means we have to change the way that we, like traditional learning, when I went to school was set up based on an agricultural system. We still do that to a certain degree, which is not fair to these kids because most of our parents are farmers mm -hmm. and things have changed. So we need to really look at how we grade and is it to the best interest of our students as well as we also said we need more staff. And I know that's a funding issue, but we may need more people to really reach out as well as help our teachers and anyone else who works in the, sense, in the system because they've been traumatized too. Mm -hmm. We say the kids, but what about the teachers? We need to help them because we want them to be successful. If they feel good, the hope is they'll impart that upon our young people. But if they're devastated, and then we need to recruit teachers. When I went to school, we had Future Teachers of America. We gotta figure out a way to make this a profession that people are proud of, wanna do, and not say, ah, how much you get paid? And what do I have to do? And if they really want to do it, to really help them make it and so they can come back and help and reach out. But the grading thing, I think, is something we need to look at. Yeah, I, what I hear you, my takeaway from that is, for some reason in this country now, we have gotten away from the honorableness of a public services career. Teachers are public servants, city managers are public servants, uh, and, and somehow being in public service 
um, is uh, uh, not something that a lot of folks aspire to. Uh, and we've somehow got to figure out how do we reinstill the notion that a career in public services is an honorable career. And I was in the building, I was in this building two days ago at a health fair, and, and so the table I was with, the young people, I asked them, have you ever just been sitting and saying, I want to help people when I grow up? And they all said, yeah. And I said, there's a whole lot of ways you can help people when you grow up. The trick is, how do you figure out how to do that? You've already, uh, you've already said, this is what I want to do. Now, what is your pathway? That's what I heard you say. So closing thoughts, because we got 10 minutes. Okay. Um, yes, ma'am. Closing thoughts. There is a thought exchange QR code. I'll put it up here. If you don't, you don't have to do it now. We'll also make sure it gets on our website and other outlets so that we can make sure that we engage as many um, voices um, as possible. I will share just, um, I heard a lot about the student voice. I will share the students have shared a lot of things with me and at my next uh, meeting with them in March, um, actually the commissioner of education will be there and some of the state um, school board members will be there. And the st students are actually looking at what are the requirements around minutes and we'll be looking at what an ideal schedule would look like from their perspective, but they have to know and understand that there are some things that are out of our control. We, the state, they were coming to visit me just on their annual, but it happens to be when I'll be with them. So they'll be, they'll get to hear firsthand from our students about, because some of those things are restricted by what is required at those levels. So thank you all for being here. I don't know if any of the board members have any Last Mr. Chairman, minutes. you get the last word, sir. Yeah, I was going to open it up for mm -hmm. the board. Just really quickly, um, a reminder that on April 22nd, it is another Saturday, we are hosting another, the board is hosting another listening and lear learning tour. Um, I believe that one is at Central Office at 10 a.m. Um, at least that's where it's being hosted currently. So 10 a.m. on Saturday, April 22nd at Central Office. So we'd love to have you back, invite some of your friends. Um, we'd love to continue the conversation um, going for that as well. Um, and then um, So Dr. Stubblefield just shared the focus of that conversation will be around the ESSER dollars or the funding that the districts received um, specifically from COVID and how those are being used and crosswalking them with the conversations that happened today as well. Um, so we'd love to have you out. out. There will be more information on the website. Um, you'll get an email. I'm sure communications will make sure to get that information out. But that is April 22nd, 10 a.m. Um, and more information will be shared. Um, también quiero agradecer a las familias que llegaron um, que hablan español, gracias por acompañarnos y queremos seguir que, que tengan que tengamos familias, más familias uh, que hablen español que nos acompañen, gracias a la señora Andrade y señora Rodríguez por a, ayudarnos uh, como intérpretes a uh, María Cristina, Tere y a Rudy Padilla, gracias por acompañarnos to all of you, thank you for taking part of your Saturday to join us, um, this is really critical as we continue to do the work as a board as a district, as leadership, to make sure that we are providing the quality education that all of our students deserve. So thank you for that. Thank you again, Wyandotte, for opening your doors. Ms. Russell and any other board members, if you have anything else to share, um, I'll open the floor. I also just uh, wanted to come up here and say thank you. Um, it takes a lot to take a chunk out of your Saturday afternoon. Um, we tried to not do it early so you could sleep in a little bit. Um, <laughs> and then, um, you know, in the middle of your day to come here, um, I just wanted to thank those from the community that showed up, but also our staff, um, because that is just a testament of your commitment to our district. Um, and then lastly, I just wanted you all to um, I believe it's on the website, um, 
the, based on some of the conversations I heard today, I don't want this to be the last place that you can connect and hear around um, academy, um, I mean, academics and facilities. Um, so on the website underneath the Board of Education, um, we do actually have two committees that focus on those things. Um, you, um, I don't think, can participate in the committee meetings, but you can connect with that chair as well as um, tune in to those meetings to hear what's being discussed and then of course provide your feedback there is a facilities committee committee if i can get the words out my mouth um, that is currently reviewing all of our we're going through a master plan um, that is reviewing all of our buildings as well as our attachments including fields and those other district properties that we own to forecast what a plan looks like um, in connection with enrollment and all of the other pieces the academy uh, the academy academic committee oh i am the chair of the facilities committee so if you have questions or comments or feedback follow up on that academy the third uh, academic i still cannot get the word out of my mouth um it's chaired uh by dr Wynn and who is the chair by Ms. oh miss drew miss drew i'm so sorry she does finance she does finance she's all about the money um but the academic committee is chaired by Ms. Drew, and they are also looking at curriculum and all of those things. So if you have additional feedback and thoughts around that, feel free to reach out to Ms. Drew, send her a note, um, or Dr. Campbell, who is also kind of the staff person on that committee as well. I just want to say thank you, but please connect with more parents and the community because we need to have input from everybody um, because this you know we pay taxes and in our group is like funding 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 there's a lot of as dr uh, said, there's a lot of resources but we've got to spend it wisely to circle back to engage the student so that's that's my spill thanks for coming out but please next time anytime we need more parents and we need more community people well said. We are. Dismissed. We will get the correct uh, QR code on our website. What you have on your paper is correct. You can share that with whomever, and they can give feedback. So thank you. Are you going to push your? Thank you. The meeting adjourned. is adjourned at two fifty nine, Mr. Lopez. <laughs> Pretty good.